attention to a couple of things in our weekly window. If you will take notice of them, I would appreciate it. Um, next Sunday is our final Sunday of Sunday School. And so um, be sure to be here and be sure to take that opportunity to say thank you to Sunday School teachers for all their dedication this year. And then please note that Vacation Bible School information is in here. This year we're trying uh, Vacation Bible School a little bit later. We're doing it in July. So spread the word, tell everybody you know about it. It is open to the community, it's open to anybody, and it is a great <coughs> opportunity to come here in the evening. And we set it up in the evening to make it easier for parents who work. Um, it's a great opportunity to hear the stories of our faith and do crafts and sing songs and just have fun together. So please take note of that information. Glad you're all here. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here today. Uh, a couple of announcements. Um, my, uh, microphone just slipped off my belt here. Um, next Sunday is going to be our uh, music appreciation Sunday, music ministry Sunday. Uh, choirs that will be singing, the handbells is going to be magnificent. We're going to have uh, Jason Flash will be back with us playing the trumpet, so that will be very exciting. So uh, come bring your friends and neighbors, and it's going to be a wonderful service. Gentlemen, notice in uh, weekly window that uh, Beer Burgers and the Bible has been moved up a week this month because of uh, Memorial Day, so we will be meeting a week from tomorrow, the 21st. So uh, please keep that in mind. The same place down at the public house at 630. Um, and I hope you'll take note of the article that's on the back of your weekly window about the book that uh, Jennifer Bellini and Walt Manis are writing about uh, our 175 years here at the church. They really need your input about memories of the church, whether it's recent, whether it's long past, or whatever. And you'll notice on your um, weekly window insert sheet, there's a place for you to write those memories. So all you gotta do is jot them down, put them in the offering plate, give them to me or give them to uh, Jennifer. She's over there, wave your hand, Jennifer. So there, back to where we are. Walt's not here today. Uh, but also, if you uh, want to email them, you'll see their email addresses uh, there as well. So please keep that in mind. Uh, Lord, you have an answer about strengthening the church. Um, on May 27th, we will be collecting for our second UCC special offering. It's called Strength in the Church, and like all kinds of information in your bulletins and on our website, um, we have UCC.org. Um, they've got some really inspiring stories about how the funds are used, and they are used um, to uh, fund new UCC churches and support programs for youth and young adults, which of course is the Church of Tomorrow. So on May 27th, please give to her today. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Scott Richardson has a stewardship moment for us. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You said a couple words, Laura, along the way, that uh, the church of tomorrow. You know, John Cooper, Mary Kirkman, and I have been up here the last several weeks reminding us about uh, all the many activities and programs, uh, wonderful things, just a few of them, actually, that our church supports through our collective annual giving. Um, for two reasons. One, to remind us what we do here, but also to say thank you. That is an extremely important part of what we do. About 90% of our operation budget comes from our annual gifts. But we also recognize that there are other ways uh, that people uh, can choose to give and want to give. We're going to start providing some supportive information about that. So sometime over the next week when the back where it comes in, we'll start having brochures out of the vegetable uh, called Foundation for the Future. And it is about a concept called planned giving. And as you might imagine, uh, it is a gift that you plan now while you're here, but isn't funded uh, either to the church or to other church contributions or endeavors in your favor um, when you're gone. So once you take care of yourself and your family, this is a great way to leave a legacy and again uh, build a foundation for the future. So we hope you find this interesting and do something proactive with what you have in the circle. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Hope that uh, some of you will consider. Any other announcements this morning? Yes, Mark. Hang on just a second. I'm just calling up. I 
I have confirmation pictures to give to all the confirmants, of which I see many are missing today. They're resting up from last week, I know. And if you are a mentor and I happen to take your picture, then I have pictures for you also. So um, see me take your pictures. That's great. Good morning. I just want to say thank you to the church for allowing the Northern Illinois Judge of Justice people to meet here yesterday afternoon. It was a fantastic, inspiring meeting. Northern Illinois Judge of Justice is an activist group that is right in Governor Quinn's face and the legislator's face to protect unions, to protect workers' rights, and to protect teachers and public employees. So uh, go online, check them out, and thanks again to our church. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, we, they, we posted them several times, so we'll continue to do so. Any other announcements? Then find somebody you haven't spoken to and tell them you're glad to see them. Thank you so much. If you would find the welcome book in your pew that looks like this and open it up and fill out all the information that we asked for, we would appreciate that. And then when everybody on your pew is filled out, please pass it back. If this is your first time with us here at First Congregational Church, we hope it won't be your last, and that you'll come back and be a part of all of our activities here in this wonderful place. Let's remember that guided by the Holy Spirit, the purpose of First Congregational United Church of Christ in Elgin is to seek God's truth, practice Christ's teachings, and love others unconditionally. God is still speaking. Are you listening?
peace of God might permeate the life of the human family. May the love of Christ fill our hearts, our lives, and our world. To the glory of God. Amen.
You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. But show a steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Our second reading today is Mark 3, verses 31 through 35, found on 918 in your Pew Bible or in large print, page 46. Hear now the words from Mark 3, verses 31 through 35. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister. Considering all she'd been through, 
But the two boys had the words juvenile detention written all over them. The oldest was autistic, we found out, and that helped us to deal with it, but he was still a big, hulking, reckless kid who either ignored you completely or bullied his way into any situation, no matter what it might do to somebody else. The younger child, the younger boy, seethed with rage every moment, smoldering rage all the time. He never smiled. He never spoke except to disagree or to spout venom. And he treated everyone around them as if they didn't even exist. I tried to speak to him on several occasions during the week, and all I got from him was a scowl. Now, each of our family unit in our clan rents their own beach houses, and so we didn't have to be around those boys all the time. But you know, the whole point of the vacation is to be together as much as possible. And so whenever we were all together, we were all on edge. Those boys ran and ripped through the house, knocked things over, shouted, fought, and after they were gone, everybody breathed a collective sigh of relief. My brother started calling them Walker and Texas Ranger after the two hellions in the movie Talladega Nights, if you've seen that one. Well, then the word began to spread through the family that Melissa wanted to marry their dad. Now, she had already been through one awful marriage, and this one promised to be even worse. We knew Melissa always had a soft spot in her heart for children, but these were not children. They were Dracula and Frankenstein on a runaway freight train. My mother and several of Melissa's cousins tried to talk her out of it, but she was determined to take on those boys and help them. A few weeks after the vacation, Melissa married the guy, and all that menagerie took up residence in the house in Delonica, Georgia. I figured Melissa was now spending most of her time with those boys, either at the hospital or the local jail. Well, the next summer, we all gathered for the big family vacation again, and quite frankly, I was kind of dreading it this time. But right off the bat, I could tell something was different. Oh, the boys were still boys. You know, like all boys that age, they had all the subtlety and nuance of an adult. But the older one seemed like he had matured three or four years just in the last year. And the younger one, I actually saw him smile. One afternoon, my sister Pam was standing next to the door, and I saw a look of utter surprise as she stepped aside to let that younger boy out the door. And I said, Pam, what was that all about? And she said, he said, excuse me. <laughs> Now, compared to the year before, that, those two words were like a soliloquy from Hamlet. <laughs> Throughout the week, they were polite, they talked, they interacted with the other children and the adults, they ate at the table with utensils. <laughs> <laughs> they walked erect. I've never seen such a transformation in 12 months. We were all wrong about those kids, particularly me. And Melissa was right about it. She saw something in them that none of the rest of us could see. However, that doesn't explain everything. A stable home life was a part of it, of course. Some good counselors at their school was a part of it. A loving, compassionate, consistent mother figure like Melissa was a huge part of it. But there was something deeper. Educator Ruby Payne says there are three voices inside every person's head that guide our decisions and our actions. She said there is the child voice, there is the parent voice, and there is the adult voice. The child voice can be whimsical and playful, but it can also be defensive and whiny and victimized. The parent voice can be loving and supportive, but it can also be authoritarian and judgmental, and sometimes even threatened. The adult voice, however, is the non-judgmental voice. It's the voice of questions. The adult voice is the creative voice. It's the positive voice. Pain claims that children who grow up in very unstable homes have to take on parent-like responsibilities long before they're ever able to handle them, and thus, they never really develop that adult voice in their head. 
They never learn to negotiate. They never learn to look at life from different sides. And thus, when a grown-up tries to give them direction, it becomes a clash of the titans. One parent voice against another parent voice. Those two boys had had to parent themselves and each other for so long, they had never developed even the seedlings of an adult voice. Melissa came along and used her adult voice, not her parent voice, to talk to them, to care for them, to love them. And it made all the difference. I can't help wondering if the divisions that are abroad in our society these days really boil down to this very thing. We're all talking to one another in our parent voices instead of adult voices. We're telling each other what to do. We're telling each other what to think. We're telling each other what to feel. We're telling each other how to vote instead of dialoguing with one another and trying to understand one another. And it all starts with the family, of course, as it did with these boys. Do we listen to our adult voice? Or do we lurch between the child voice that tells us we're powerless or the parent voice that says we're always right? Deuteronomy 5 warns us against idolatry and then says God is a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, when I first read that, I thought, you know, that sounds awful cruel. I mean, why would my children and grandchildren have to suffer because of my own boneheaded selfishness? But that verse isn't a threat from God as much as it is an observation. The ancient Hebrews, you see, had no well-defined concept of an afterlife, and so whatever blessing or sorrow was going to come to you came to you in this life, not the next life. And since the basic unit of society in the ancient Hebrew world was not the individual like it is for us, but the family, the idea was that a parent's actions are going to reverberate down through their descendants. You know, it's really no different us. Everybody knows that if I beat my children, they'll be more likely to beat their children. If I think the world is against me, my children would be likely to think the world is against them. And if my mom and daddy didn't have any children, chances are my children won't have any either. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to throw that in. The point is that once the dominoes start falling, they will continue to topple over until somebody stops them. If Melissa had not come into those boys' lives, they would have become everything I initially thought they would be. But Melissa used an adult voice with them and taught them to develop an adult voice, and the chain was broken. Without the adult voice, the child would just keep on replicating the sins of the parents. They can't help it. That's all they know to do. I heard a story about a frail old man who couldn't live alone anymore. And so he went to live with his son and daughter-in-law and their four-year-old son. Well, every night when the family ate supper together, the old man's hands would shake and the peas would fall off of his spoon onto the table and he'd spill his wine on the floor. His eyesight was bad and he was constantly knocking over his water glass or he would dish food onto the tablecloth instead of his plate. And after a while, his son and daughter-in-law got so irritated with the mess that he made every night that they set up a separate table off in the corner of the dining room and served him his meals over there and served them in a wooden bowl because he was wont to often even drop the plates and break them. They said, well, in a wooden bowl he can't break them. So every night he would sit over there by himself, fumbling with his food, tear forming in his eye whenever his daughter or son-in-law would glare at him for dropping some food. And then one day, the old man's son came home and he found his son, his four-year-old, playing on the floor with some strips of wood. And he said, what are you making, son? And the little boy said, oh, I'm making a little bowl for you and mama to eat your food in. 
than when I grow up. The boy's father and mother looked at each other. And with tears in their eyes that night, they went over and took Grandpa by the hand and led him back to the family table where he ate with his loved ones every night for the rest of his life. You see, that parent voice will have negative repercussions over several generations. The adult voice can produce positive repercussions for even longer than that. Melissa is creating a wonderful legacy in her family, and I pray the same for my family, and I pray the same for your family. But I also pray the same for this family. This church family, this faith family, I want us to learn to listen to our adult voice in our heads and to speak to each other in adult voices because that's where I'm convinced the Holy Spirit speaks to us. The Spirit gives us the courage to see things from a different side. The Spirit gives us the ability to speak with love instead of fear. The Spirit help us to, helps us to reframe a problem in Christ-like ways. When Jesus' family came to see him in today's reading from Mark 3, they spoke to him in a parent voice. They sent word in the, into the house to tell Jesus that his family's out here. If he knows what's good for him, he'll come out. So a messenger came in and said, your brother and brothers are outside and they want you to come out. Now, Jesus could have responded in the child voice. He could have said, oh, I've been a bad boy. And my family just makes me so miserable. Or he could have responded in the parent voice, you tell my mother and my brothers if they want to see me there, come in here. But he didn't do that. He spoke in an adult voice. He put a creative spin on the whole situation. He turned the event into a teachable moment. He framed that whole event in terms of discipleship. He said, here are my mother." Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. I've said to you before that more and more people are turning away from the church in this country. And it's especially true among young adults. And the reasons vary greatly, but they all really boil down to this. They think that we Christians cannot speak in an adult voice. They think all we do is speak in the parent voice, judging, demanding, punishing. And you say, well, that doesn't describe us here at First Congregational Church. Well, guess what? That's the way we're perceived. Pastor Shane Wheeler was introduced to a young man by the name of Greg, who is gay. And they exchanged the usual pleasantries about family, where they live, and their jobs. But when Wheeler said that he was a pastor, Greg's whole demeanor shifted. He lost into a tirade about all the hateful things that had been hurled at him by Christians because of his sexual orientation. He talked about all the wounds he carried with him every day, inflicted on him by people who claimed to be followers of Jesus Christ, and he went on and on and on until finally Wheeler interrupted him and said, hey, tell you what, you don't assume that I'm a gay, hating bigot, and I don't assume you're a pedophile. Deal? <laughs> well, that stopped him in his trap. And then Wheeler continued. He said, look, if we buy into stereotypes, we'll never be able to love one another. Greg said, really? He said, really? And the tears began to stream down Greg's face. And then with level gaze, he looked at Wheeler and asked, are you sure you're a Christian? <laughs> and then it was Wheeler's turn to cry. It's a haunting question, isn't it? 
Are you sure you're a Christian if you don't judge someone who's different from you? Are you sure you're a Christian if you don't condemn a lifestyle that makes you uncomfortable? Are you sure you're a Christian if you don't categorize human beings into neat cubby holes of right and wrong? Are you sure you're a Christian if you don't believe you have the truth and everybody else is either stupid or downright evil? Are you sure you're a Christian when you'd rather act like Jesus instead of hurl his name at someone like a javelin? Are you sure you're a Christian when you agree with Paul who said, In Christ there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus? Are you sure you're a Christian when you'd rather speak in the adult voice rather than the parent voice? Oh, our sins as Christians are being visited upon our children and our grandchildren, but it doesn't have to be that way. We can stop the dominoes from falling anymore. We can leave a legacy of love and Christ-likeness. It's not too late. It's not too late. Professor Tom Long is an active member of the Central Presbyterian Church in Atlanta. He tells about a poor man, I'm going to call him Ralph, who came to the church one day for some help and then stuck around. The church folks did what they could to get him on his feet, find him a place to stay, find him a little penny any job that at least kept the roof over his head, stuff like that. Well, then Ralph started coming to worship on a regular basis. But he wanted some nice clothes to wear to church, and so they told him, the church said, well, we got a clothes closet down here. Just go in there and pick out whatever you want. And so Ralph went into the clothes closet, and he picked out a lime green tuxedo. <coughs> so then Ralph took it upon himself to become the church's unofficial greeter. Every Sunday, Ralph donned his lime green tuxedo and staked out a spot on the front steps of the building and greeted everybody who showed up with a hug and a kiss. First time visitors were taken a little aback, but most of the Central Presbyterian Church people just accepted the fact that when they came to worship, they were going to get a hug and a kiss from Ralph on the front steps. But then one Sunday, Ralph and his tuxedo were not in their usual spot. In fact, Ralph didn't show up at all that day. Then he didn't show up the following Sunday. A third Sunday, Ralph was AWOL again. Well, now the church folks started getting worried. What if he was seriously ill? What if he had fallen? What if the poor guy had suddenly died in that dinky little apartment of his? Ralph didn't have a phone because he couldn't afford one, but they knew his address, and so several of the church folks went over to his apartment, and they got the landlord to open Ralph's door. They didn't find Ralph. In fact, turns out he had just gone to visit an out-of-town relative for a few weeks, so everything was fine. But inside his apartment, they found some of the most unusual wallpaper they had ever seen. Every wall, every ceiling was plastered with worship bulletins from Central Presbyterian Church. Every Sunday, Ralph would come home and take that Sunday's worship bulletin and paste it on a wall or paste it on the ceiling so that from the time he woke up in the morning till the time he turned off his light at night, he was reminded of a community of faith who welcomed him with love and accepted him as one. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother, Jesus said. I want to be a part of that family. I want lots of others to be in that family too. As you ponder the words of the sermon, I invite you to pray.
pray with me and then to pray silently. Oh, gracious God, we know that too often it's that parent voice that comes out that spews judgment, that finds differences instead of likenesses. And so we ask for the adult voice, the voice that speaks of inclusion, the voice that draws us together. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and arms to welcome one another as all a part of your family. We pray in Jesus' name.
diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, her uh, surgery is complete, and now she's beginning uh, radiation and chemo treatment. So we want to pray for uh, Vanessa. Uh, our own Pat Lindquist uh, fell this past week uh, and uh, really injured herself. Uh, she was at the 815 service today, so uh, she's feeling much better, but she kind of looks like a raccoon. Both eyes are black, and she's got a gash in her face. And so, uh, But she says she's doing all right, so we want to continue to pray for her. Kathy Turnquist was in the hospital this past week uh, with pneumonia. Uh, she is now out and uh, will be continuing to take treatments for pneumonia. Uh, Frank Kottmeyer's uncle Don uh, had a, suffered a cardiac arrest uh, there two weeks ago, and they asked us to pray for him. Uh, Helen LaFleur, Helen, there you, there you are, uh, had some tests this week. I suppose you don't have any results back from that yet. Okay, so we will continue to pray about that. Kurt Perrin will be going in for tests on the 17th uh, this week, so we want to pray for Kurt. Um, the Kaufmans asked us to pray for friends of theirs, Tom uh, Lesher, uh, who had uh, bypass surgery, and Vince Rich, who uh, just had colon cancer surgery. Um, and um, Troy Moore's family has suffered another loss. Um, most of you know that his wife Nancy died a couple of months ago, and now Troy's niece, Debbie Cunningham, died very suddenly. So we won't remember. Troy, you and all of your family uh, in this time. Uh, I have several joys to share. Uh, first of all, uh, some of you know that Mark Velasquez, uh, the doctors say that surgery is not needed at this time, and so we're delighted about that, that uh, for the time being, he's out of the woods at least. And then um, our own Diana Castillo, uh, you didn't see the article in the paper, she's, there you are, where's her? She, is she gone to the class? Okay. Uh, Diana was uh, named this, uh, this week as the uh, uh, student representative to the uh, U46 school board. Uh, so, uh, so we've got our folks in all kinds of places in the community. Uh, we're taking over. Uh, so <laughs> we're delighted uh, that uh, Diana is there, and we're so proud that she's a part of this uh, church family. And then uh, Mari Munch has a birthday, is it today, Mari? 88 years old today. Well, you don't look a day over 102. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a real delight. Those are the prayer requests I have. So choir, the Lord be with you. The Lord be with you. Let's sing together as we prepare the prayer. Rich. We pray, O oh Lord, for the Moore family in 
in this time of their loss. And we pray that they will know your presence and your touch, perhaps more fully than they ever have. We pray for all of those who are walking this morning in the valley of grief. We pray that they will know your presence in a very, very special way. And now, Lord, we call out to you by name the concerns we have on our hearts this morning. God of grace.
you. Listen to your adult voice. Because that's where the Spirit will speak to you. And then use that adult voice as you speak to your family, to your church family, and to anyone else you meet. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and